So concurrency management. We talked about a bunch of things last time. We said that different transactions read and write different items. So and they arrive at random times into the transaction manager. So the order that they happen is called a schedule. A schedule is a sequence of operators, operations. Things like transaction one reads X, transaction two reads Y, transaction two reads also X, transaction one writes X, transaction two, um, or let's say transaction three reads Y, and transaction three writes Y, and transaction two writes X something like this. So this is the order things have happened, right? So time goes this way. So that means first this happened and so on and so forth. And the main thing you care about is if the schedule is a good schedule or a bad schedule. So the good schedule is the one where um, we can say effects of this is the same as a serial schedule, right? So any serial schedule is good, but as long as the effects of a schedule is the same as a serial schedule, then this is a good schedule, which we call a serializable schedule. It's a big word, right? Serializable schedule means that it will have the same final result as a schedule in which one transaction executed at a time. So the final results are the same as a serial schedule. A serializable schedule is our gold standard. We want to make sure that there is some sort of mechanism is in place such that whenever the transaction is executed, the schedule that comes out is serialized. Okay, so this is our gold standard. And we said that, okay, it's very easy to find if things are serializable or not. What we can do is we can look at a schedule and look at all conflicting operations. So a conflict is you have one transaction reads something, another transaction writes the same thing, you know, either way. Or both transactions write the same thing, right? So for example, if I have all the conflicts here, read one of x, it does not conflict with the read of the same thing. It does not conflict with the write with itself, but it does conflict with the write of 2 of x, right? And then I also have read 2 of y conflicts with w3 of y. Read 2 of x conflicts with write 1 of x. And write 1 of x conflicts with write 2 of x. Okay. So if you get all the conflicts, now you can draw what is called a conflict graph. The conflict graph will basically have a vertex for every single node and it will have a link from one node to another if transaction one does something that conflicts with transaction two before, right? So R1 did something that conflicts with two before two, so I'm going to have a link like this. This tells me that in any serial schedule, T1 must come before T2. This one has 2 comes before 3, so in any serial schedule, 2 must come before 3. This one is the same as this one, except this one, R2 of x and W1 of x, is telling me that T2 must come before T1. But this is not possible, right? You cannot have 1 come before 2, 2 must come before 1. As a result, this is not serializable because there is a cycle in the um, schedule, right? So if there is a cycle in conflict graph, 
then schedule is not serializable. This is kind of the basic idea. This is a bad schedule because transaction one and transaction do, th do things that change each other's data. There is no serial schedule that will give you the same result. Okay, And why is it it's a bad thing? Well, think about what's happening here. right? So you have read one of x. Okay. Then you have read two of x. Then you have write one of x. And then you have write two of x. Okay. So let's say, for example, in the beginning you have x is equal to 10. And all these transactions are doing is just incrementing x, right? So transaction 1 reads x. Here, it reads it as 10. And it makes it 11. But before it writes, transaction 2 also reads. And says that it is 10 and increments it to 11. These two are still in memory, right? So now, transaction 1 is going to go first and write 11. So x is actually going to be 11 here. And then transaction 2 is going to write next. And what's it going to write? Again, 11, right? Because it didn't actually learn that the value of x has changed, right? It just basically acted on the old value thread. And now, I have basically executed two transactions that incremented x, right? So the x's value should be what? 12, right? But it is going to be 11, right? So basically, because they are executing at the same time, changing the same data, but in a bad way, I have lost some information because if you executed 1 before 2 and 4 2 before 1, the final result would have been. The left 12, right? This you can do the same thing in many different ways, right? So, for example, you can have one adds five, one adds ten, one adds and one subtracts, but you cannot know what these transactions are going to do. You can at least make sure that they can execute in a way that erases each other's results. Okay? Now, serializability is a very, very strong guarantee. If it's serializable, nothing bad can happen. But there may be many other cases that it's not serializable and nothing bad will happen. But that will depend on I know something about my transaction. So you will find a lot of database systems, they have different guarantees. And you know, this is kind of the whole no SQL movement because you know this may not be necessary for an application where you are storing your Facebook updates, right? It is not like money, right? If your if your one update is lost, do you uh, feel like it's like loss of life? <laughs> no, right? So in that case, you may not use serializability. You may use a simpler transaction model. But this comes from things like you know money and um, financial transactions and um, you know Wall Street, where you actually have to make sure you can never lose data, and so it's a strong guarantee. Okay. So the main point is that I want to make sure that my uh, transactions are serializable. So serializable means that I read values that were changed by committed transactions. And whenever I write values, those values will be the same as a serial schedule, as if transactions were executing one at a time. Well, how can we make sure that we can never get bad transactions, okay, bad uh, schedules? So how to avoid bad schedules? Okay, so you can be very pessimistic, and uh, you can say, I will make sure nothing, can, nothing bad can possibly happen. And to ensure that, I will use locks. 
I will make sure that only one person can access a data item at a time, and I'm going to lock it. And when I lock it, and if you have the lock, you can use it. Nobody else can. And if you want to really, you know, use this, then you basically need to wait. So if the schedule wants to read and it asks for a lock, you're going to make that transaction wait until the lock is available. Okay, so basically, locks are a um, simple system, but you're going to avoid certain schedules by making transactions wait if they don't have the lock that they have, that they need. I'm going to use some very uh, unpleasant bathroom analogy in a second. I apologize for that, but it's important. Um, so, you can also be optimistic. And say that, you know, bad stuff doesn't really happen that frequently, right? How, how likely is it going to happen? I'm not going to be stupid, but I'm not going to check everything in advance, right? By the time you turn in your, uh, you know, transaction, I am going to check if you've done something bad, okay? So basically, this is a more relaxed point where I'm going to use timestamps to kind of keep track of who's doing what. So whenever you change something, I'm going to assign a timestamp of the transaction that changed it. And then I'm going to allow different ones to uh, go in parallel until I see something bad happen. In that case, I'm going to abort that transaction altogether and then restart it. Okay. In, in the other one, you suspend transactions. if they cannot get a lock. Here I will abort transactions if they did a bad thing. So a lot of databases actually use lock-based systems, so I will, use, I will talk about that. But Postgres happens to use the optimistic one. It is called multi-version concurrency control. Or MBCC. That basically actually use timestamps. And what you have is you have different versions of the same item all existing at the same time because you create different uh, versions. It's like, uh, you know, Flash goes to Earth 2, you know, and then there's an Earth 2 Flash and a regular Flash, right? So all of that is kind of what multi-version control is like. It's a little complex to explain, but I will try to uh, tell you a little bit. But if you are going into a database uh, kind of uh, work, you should definitely read about NBCC, which is extremely cool stuff, okay? so. First, I will talk about blocks, and if I have a little bit of time, I will talk about MVCC. Okay, all right, so, Lux. So the idea is that I'm going to have this extra data structure called a lock. So for each item, only one transaction can hold a lock. So it's like, okay, there it comes. It's like you have a bathroom. Only one person goes to the bathroom at a time. So I give you the key. You go in, you lock the door. When you're done, you come out. There's always only one transaction at any point in time for that specific item. Where it fails down is that you have multiple bathrooms for a single transaction. All right, never mind. Um, so uh, here's my protocol. It says that any transaction reading or writing an item X must get a lock for it. Okay? If you 
cannot get your lock, then you have to wait until the lock becomes available. If lock is not available, suspend, wait until it becomes available. The point is that, you know, it is basically um, some schedules are not going to be possible because you cannot just do everything in the same order, right? Now, it is not a protocol unless you actually tell me how long I should keep the locks, right? Because everything that I just did is still possible as long as you get a lock first and then you immediately release a lock, right? So this schedule is still totally possible. You get a lock first and you release the lock immediately, right? So it only becomes interesting if you actually have some rules on how long you should keep the locks, right? So what you're going to do is we are going to have a protocol called two-phase locking. And basically, a transaction can be in only one of two states. Or phases. In the growing phase, transaction can only get new locks. Well, what that means is that if you need a new lock, you can ask for that lock. If it's not available, you wait. When you are woken up, you get your lock. And if you're in growing phase, you can keep getting new locks. In the shrinking phase, you can only release locks. So the idea is that, you know, when you first start, you're a fresh transaction, you're asking for locks, asking for new locks and so on, at some point you are done, and as soon as you start releasing your locks, you are in your shrinking phase, at which point you can release more locks, but you cannot get any new locks, right? So you can never get any new locks. So... You basically transition one from the other as soon as you release a lock. Not only you must get locks, but you must keep your locks as long as you need new locks. As soon as you are done with your locks, you can start releasing them. You can release them one at a time or many at a time. But once you start releasing locks, you cannot get any new locks. So this is the basic idea of a two-phase locking. And it's basically what's implemented in a lot of databases in you know, more sophisticated forms. So the idea of a two-phase locking is that so two-phase locking, or 2PL, guarantees serializability. That if you deploy two-phase locking, no schedule you generate can ever be not serializable. Okay. So I'm not going to do a formal proof, but I'm going to show you the idea of it, one example. Okay? Why is it that you can never get a cycle? So I will show you that if 2PL is used, no cycle is possible. Okay. 
So let's see an example, and then you know you can kind of generalize from that. This is not this is not a proof that uh, you know Malik will approve, but we will we will do we will do one just then as an example. Okay, don't write this down as a proof. Um, okay, so let's say I had something like this. What was it? I had R one of x. Then I had R2 of x. I'm just looking at the thing that causes a uh, cycle. Okay. And then W2 of x. Okay. This is actually going to be, uh, I'm not even going to get to here. I'm just going to stop here. Okay. So this schedule is not possible under 2PL. Right, so this is not possible. I can never get this kind of a schedule if I was using two-phase locking. Okay, let's see what what needs to happen for this to happen. Right, so for read one to happen, I need to actually lock that first. Right, so that means. I need to be able to lock x first, right? So at this point, t1 must have a lock on x, okay? If, in fact, r2 of x happens later, if r2 of x happens afterwards, can you tell me what must have happened in between these two points? It must have been released, right? Because for T2 to get a lock, T1 must release a lock. So there is a release, release lock of 1 of x. T1 released lock. Now, if T1 released the lock, what, what happens? T1 is in which phase? As soon as you release a lock, no more locks for you, right? Whatever locks you need, hopefully you got before this point because at this point, no other locks. So T1 is in shrinking phase. Also, it must be the case that T2 got a lock so that this has happened, right? T2 must lock x. Okay. All right, so now let's come to w1 of x. How about w1 of x? If you come to w1 of x, what must have happened? If, if w1 of x happened, then it means t1 has lock x again. But it doesn't have the lock here, but it must have the lock here. But can it have the lock? No, because it's a shrinking phase, right? So you can, you will fail up here. So T1 cannot lock X again. So since in shrinking phase. So this cannot happen. So anytime you have a cycle, you will see that basically you need resources, right? So the cycle means that one needs resources for two, two needs resources for one. And you will always find that that because of the cycle, one must release the resource for two, so one is in shrinking mode, and that must get the resource that T2 needs after that point. But since T2, uh, since it's in shrinking mode, it cannot get any new lines. So for any, any scenario, you will basically get a case like this. So since you cannot get any cycles, you are guaranteed that this is actually a serializable schedule. Okay? So two-phase locking actually guarantees serializability. Um, but it is also very restrictive. So 
you are going to basically disallow many, many okay things. For example, this was okay up to here. It goes bad here, right? I actually should have avoided the second right, but maybe this was okay that if these both read, as long as this didn't write later, this would have been okay. So because of this, I need to avoid good things and bad things. More of good things, less of bad things. So one of the things that you can do to do that is to change your scheme to have two types of locks. Okay? Indeed, you don't actually generally use a single type of lock, you use at least two types of locks. So we have one lock called shared or read lock. Many transactions can hold a read lock on the same item. So there can be many readers, but there can only be one writer, which is called, so this is, we are going to use S. Uh, exclusive or right lock, which we call X. Only one transaction can write an item. And not only that, if you're writing an item, nobody can read that item, right? So it's an exclusive lock, meaning that it's like the old lock that we had. So, so the idea is the following. So let's say that you have suppose that you are looking at some data item and there may be no lock on that item. Somebody may have a shared lock or somebody may have an exclusive lock, right? So if I look at the requested lock, so suppose the transaction wants to get a shared lock on this item. If there is no other locks, of course you can get a shared lock. If there is another shared lock, another person is reading the same item, you still can get a shared lock. If somebody is write, writing that item, you cannot get a lock. Okay, so you can get a lock if nobody is reading it or somebody is reading it, but not when somebody is writing it. If you request an X lock, again, if nobody is touching that item, you can get a shared lock, but you cannot get an exclusive lock in any other case. So what we want to do is we want to modify our algorithm, our protocol, to account for this. Okay. So I'm going to write this down, then we'll stop. The ProBlank kids outside are making a lot of noise. Uh, but not, but not the awesome programming uh, students in this room. Um, all right, so let's try two-phase locking again. <coughs> okay, so nothing much will change. So you basically, transactions must get S lock to read and x lock to write. Okay. And um, transactions cannot release a cannot get a new lock after releasing one. So the same thing with, you know, if it's in the shrinking uh, phase, you cannot get a new lock. So 
once you release a lot, you're done. But there is a loophole here, right? So suppose that you read something later, you want to write it, right? So to get then to, sh to write block, you have to first release the read block and then get the write block, but now you're in the shrinking phase, you cannot do that, right? So, uh, so to close the loophole, right? So if uh, only this transaction is holding a read lock, it can upgrade to an X lock without releasing a lock. Okay, so um, because you don't want to go into your uh, shrinking phase because you release the lock, so you basically hold your read lock and upgrade it to an X lock. And you're only going to be granted an upgrade if you actually are the only transaction reading. If you are not, then you're going to wait until you are. Right? So the same thing that happens is that, you know, wait for the lock or upgrade to be available. Now, two-phase locking is a little bit uh, better with the two types of locks because you now can use some resources instead of only reading once multiple people can read, and you still guarantee serializability. So this still guarantees serializability. Now what I recommend is you try and figure out why that is the case. You can see if you do the read and write locks, you will see that you can do these three, but you cannot get this far. Okay? With one type of lock, I fail here. With two types of lock, I can come up to this point. It's possible, but this is not possible. Okay? Because this means that T2 must have released the lock, so I have upgraded. But since now T2 is in shrinking phase, it cannot get the upgrade or the new lock. Right? So it's the same thing. It's just that now you can get more of the schedule, but you still cannot get a cycle. So, on uh, Thursday, I'm going to finish this topic, and we are going to talk about durability, and then um, we will see how far we get and continue it on next Monday.